Okay, so welcome everyone to Poetry East. Um, well, really delightful that you can join us here at the London Buddhist Centre for Poetry East. I'm going to be interviewing the art critic and historian Martin Gayford. Um, Martin Gayford has met just about everyone. He's interviewed Gerhard Richter, Aslem Kiefer, he's met Gilbert and George, he's um, been painted uh, by Lucy and Freud. We'll be talking about that. He's been he spent 750 hours, I think, something like that, sitting to be painted by Lucy and Freud. And he's just completed another book with David Hockney, his third book, I think, with David Hockney. Um, so I'm really excited to talk to him about the meaning and value of art, his work with David Hockney, his understanding of particularly recent British uh, painting in this wonderful book, Madness and, uh, Modernists and Mavericks. So, Welcome, uh, Martin. Really good to see you. Uh, well, it's it's very nice to be uh, here at uh, Poetry East, Stephen, virtually. <laughs> Even virtually, yeah. So I, I'll give you a virtual welcome. Really, really good to see you. So what I thought we we you know we pitch in with the with the ultimate question, just to make things hard for you, um, which is you know what is art for? You know, like so many people, you know, that we, we're hearing so much suffering at the moment and. Um, you know, so many people are, are are been struck by this pandemic, and we're going to have huge consequences, aren't we? Afterwards, um, you know, you know, all kinds of things to do with um, economy and so forth. So you could start to say, well, art is a luxury that we can't afford. Um, what what what's it doing for us? Um, shouldn't we be putting the money that we're putting into art into the arts into something else? And I know the arts at the moment, you could say, are in crisis. You know, the theatres are closed down. Opera houses are closed down. I can't go to the National Gallery even at the moment. Um, in the midst of this time, what can art offer us and what is it for? Uh, well, it is, as you say, a very big question. But um, <laughs> yes, I thought we'd start. I can, with... <laughs> I can give you. I can give you the just the beginning of an answer, which is, is actually it strikes me as a bit Buddhist in the in its approach. Uh, um, <laughs> And it comes up in the forthcoming uh, third book that David Hockney and I have done together, which is going to come out. It's called uh, Spring Cannot Be Cancelled, and it's going to come out in a couple of months uh, at the beginning of this spring. Great. And in it, uh, David, uh, talking about drawing, really, and, and how much he enjoys drawing and how it's a completely fulfilling activity for him and he, he says it, ta it takes him out of himself he's not aware of time uh, sometimes if he's really concentrating he he asks himself the question what is stress and gives the rather good i think simple answer it's worrying about the future it's worrying about mm -hmm. things which may happen in the future and uh drawing or looking at a drawing uh relieves you of that david's mm -hmm argues because it immerses you in the here and now if you're drawing it's now you're thinking about what's happening right now um if you're looking at really concentrating on a work of art it's the same you're just conscious of the work of art you're not conscious of the train you may be about to miss or uh, you know, the appointment you have tomorrow or the exam result you're waiting for and all those kind of things so mm -hmm. That's uh, that's part one of the of the answer, but um, art isn't alone in doing that. An awful lot of activities will uh, immerse one in the here and now. Um, according to the psychological theory of flow, which um, uh, propounded by an American psychologist who has a Hungarian name, I'm not. I'm afraid going to attempt. Yes, I, I know the name, but I can't <laughs> yes, I, I, it's. Uh, it's just too difficult, um, yeah. but uh, it's a very convincing theory, um, uh, which holds that what that happiness, it rather than being something one is conscious of as it as a sort of feeling, like feeling mm -hmm. warm, is is just being immersed, like as David is when he's drawing, in an activity which is completely absorbing. C could be any activity. But it's it, it's it's got to really hold your concentration. But mm. um, the extra element which drawing or looking at a drawing or a painting or 
actually any any work of art can offer perhaps is that especially if it's a figurative work you're also you're looking at you're learning and looking learning about and looking at an object a real thing which may be a picture mm. of the world so mm. it rivets your uh, your attention on it and also puts you back if it's figurative into the world around you and actually if it's abstract it probably enhances your sense of color form mm. line all mm. sorts of other things um so anyway that's my beginning of an answer to, mm. yeah indeed answer. It's a very good beginning. I mean, it's interesting that that whole study on flow also, one of the things it showed is that people are often happiest at work. Yes. Oh, well, that's a, well, that's a Hockney line, actually. I, I, well, oh, is it? Actually, actually, I say, because it's, it's, it takes... Yeah, I quote Noel Coward's dictum that uh, uh, work is more fun than fun. <laughs> and David, David, <laughs> David agrees. <laughs> 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 With David, it seems to be working or smoking, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, they're not uh, they're not separable as far as concerned. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, actually, one of his reasons, uh, in, not an interview with me, but with somebody else, for for refusing to give up smoke is it is is that it, it would be a distraction for him because if he gave up smoking, then instead of concentrating on on what he was doing, he'd be thinking about his desire for a cigarette. Yes, that's right. I remember this wonderful little interview where he was saying, people keep on telling me not to smoke or to be more aware of my body. He was saying, I'm over 80. I don't want to be aware of my body. Yes. You know, when, when I'm painting, when I'm drawing, I like, I'm like 30 again. Yes. And he said, well, and when I don't paint, I smoke. Yes, yes. Well, that's, uh, yeah, he says that, those kind of things in the, in the book that people, in his opinion, people spend too much time thinking about their bodies because there's always mm. something to worry about. He said, mm. uh, if you, you look for it, uh, what they should actually, uh, uh, it's actually much better for you to be immersed in something, in doing something else, to have a mm. project. Mm. Mm. I mean, I, was, I remember that, that and it'd be interesting to talk more about the spring cannot be cancelled. I remember him saying that. And there's a short video, wasn't it, that was shared, I think, by the BBC, him drawing daffodils and, to, you know, the yes. first lockdown. Um, yes. And I was very touched by that. that, that I, I, I want to come on to this, the, this thing that he talks about, is about drawing and painting being to do with the, the eye, the heart and the hand. Yes. And I, I was particularly touched by his just him saying that spring can't be cancelled. You know that that yes. whatever happens, you've still got life to look at. Yes, or or sometimes he says actually, if it, if if, if, t if spring didn't take place, we really really would be in trouble. That would right. Be yeah. <laughs> yeah, indeed. <laughs> so, can you say something more about Hockney? You know, you've worked with him a lot. You know, this is good. This is your third book uh, with him. Um, and yeah, I'm, I, I was very struck reading some of the, the interviews with him where he talks about the, the art is using the hand, the, the heart and the head. I, I wonder whether you say a bit more about those elements of the yes. work. Well, the hand is uh, uh, what you make a drawing or a painting with. And uh, David believes in, in art and also craft. He's a virtuoso. Uh, draftsman particularly uh, and has been since perhaps his teens he was really when he arrived at the Royal College of Art in 1959 um, he believes in the craft but he uh, but he also says uh, the craft you can teach the poetry you can't so there's a sort of extra ingredient which uh, only certain people have but uh, he thinks that handmade uh, images have an extra uh, something which simply mechanical ones um, uh, made by a lens and a camera for example uh, just don't and that's because uh, it's another hot hockney uh, dictum um, I could quote the quote though actually all after, <laughs> afternoon no, the, 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 the eye is connected to the mind and we see psychologically not just mm. optically so when we, oh, yeah. when we when we are looking at something uh it's uh the um 
information which passes uh, through our eyes and uh, our retinas and along the optic nerve into our brain is then processed in terms of uh, all the past experiences and feelings we've had which are relevant and mm -hmm. um, and that all comes into what we see so so when you're drawing you're drawing not just with your hand but with your mind and your mm -hmm. heart as mm -hmm. well and mm -hmm. um one last quotation from uh, David's uh, relevant, I think, to the heart is um, the answer he gave once at a press conference when a journalist asked him one of those very big, difficult questions you're asking me, which is, which was, uh, does your work have a message, Mr. Hockney? And David said, uh, uh, nothing specific, just love life. <laughs> I really like the, the weighting of that as well. Nothing specific. <laughs> it's very northern, isn't it? Nothing specific, just love life. <laughs> um, going on to that loving life, I, I wanted to sort of focus on that Royal Academy exhibition, um, you know, that I, I remember going to, I, I went to again and again. It was very, very popular amongst all the Buddhists here at the London Buddhist Centre. Every, everybody sort of made a, a pilgrimage to that exhibition. And two things struck me about it. Firstly, um, well, uh, you know, beforehand re reading some quite um, strong criticisms uh, by the critics of, of Hockney's work generally, um, that the tendency has been to say that Hockney, you know, there's questions about the level, the high key color that he uses, mm -hmm. you know, why that color, why so much of it, why are the paintings so big, um, that the, the paint handling itself it seems very crude in some places. Um, nobody seems to doubt his genius as a draftsman. He must be surely the, the great 20th century, 21st century draftsman, I think. I, I mean, nobody draws like him. Some of those early pen and ink drawings, um, things like that, that you know, that, that they're unsurpassed, I think. I think nobody doubts that. But there's been a lot of um, criticism here of him being just too much on the bright side of things, um, you know, there's been some quite unpleasant things said about him. And yet when I went, you know, what I experienced again is that love life and said so strongly and without any apology, um, without, you know, David doesn't seem to feel the need to say, don't worry, folks. I also know that things can be awful and don't worry, I've got a social conscience and don't worry, you know, there's a tragic side of life. He just seems to want to rejoice. And I, I wonder what you, and I, yeah, I was, I was struck by how many people were at the show and how many people caught onto that. It surely must be central to his uh, people, how much he's loved, is that love life message that you implicitly get from them. But yet we've got this sort of strange thing of that response and then the critical response to David's work. Mm. Yes, so as you say, the general public uh, certainly found that exhibition at the Royal Academy in 2012 elating. A lot of people said that. Mm. Uh, and no, certainly not all the critics, and not all the critics were, no, uh, that's... were damning. Um, Valdemar Nuchak, for example, was pretty upbeat about it. Um, mm. But some were um, down on it. And um, I think there are various... Uh, elements in that i mean one i think is the prophet always being without honor in their own country um mm -hmm. the other thing is some, something you, you hinted at there on the way that uh, david has always been uh, tremendously self-confidently resolutely indifferent to fashion and that's actually been going on since the mm -hmm. 1960s one of his mm -hmm. earliest public pronouncements was he stood up at the opening of one of his exhibitions at the Kasmin Gallery in I don't know 64 or something and said I would like I would like to make a public statement that I am not a pop artist which is <laughs> which, which is something he's still journalists still describe him as a pop artist yeah. but, uh, yeah. he's, he's not very interested in following movements and has always just uh, well I mean he's uh, affected by the art going on around him and as the young man was by abstract expressionism and so forth but he just does what he thinks needs to be done so he was mm. unabashedly a figurative artist and he's carried on just following his own path so um people such as critics who tend to be dedicated followers of art fashion 
often mm. are, are, are left-footed by that. There's mm. also a, um, a view which seems to me to be a bit, actually itself, a bit superficial and philistine, that art's got to be miserable, otherwise it's not serious, which, as you, yes. were, you were suggesting, is it can be miserable. That's no re re reason why it shouldn't be tragic and gloomy, but it doesn't, that do, that is not automatically the more serious kind of art. And uh, mm. another artist um, uh, I much admire, Julian Ayres, uh, mm. absolutely, mm. Absolute yeah, paint, painter was um, used to proclaim that. Why asked the rhetorical question, why shouldn't painting be joyous? And she wanted, mm. she explicitly wanted her painting to be uplifting and joyous. And mm. painting can be that. A lot of painting is that, actually, uh, of, mm. uh, of the great masters of the past. Um, uh, but uh, that can be counted as a as a stroke against him. I think. Um, Particularly in London, so particularly in Britain, I think there's a there's a can be a degree of resentment of success, and it's mm -hmm. difficult for people who uh, to accept. Well, some people find it difficult to accept that somebody who's started off here um, and uh, has developed has developed into uh, an international uh, celebrity is not has not just you know, just become too big for their boots and always being given mm. too much uh, unthinking praise or being boosted by dealers or something. Uh, mm. That's the point of view. And it tends to fade away when people become venerable and distinguished enough. It was, uh, it's not just David. Uh, Lucien Freud got that right up to the point of his 80th birthday exhibition at the Tate. And mm. then after that, it sort of reversed. And uh, by the time he died, it was, he was, pretty well university regarded as a living old master with a but with a few holdouts people who still didn't mm. like it didn't, didn't get it thought it was all overrated mm. but i mean you'll get that with all artists one of my yes. one of my great friends among critics uh, uh, doesn't like rembrandt so uh, mm, yes. <laughs> <there> oh. <laughs> How amazing um yeah it's interesting because it reminds me i remember not so long before he died went to see my old, one of my old tutors leonard mccomb Who's yeah. painting, you know, who, whose paintings I really love, you know. Um, he was showing me a painting of tulips he was doing, and I would say, I said to him, Leonard, nobody paints flowers anymore. You know, that is so uncool. Um, I meant it ironically, and he was saying, I've always done what I liked. Um, you know, I've always painted what I wanted to paint. Yes. And David seems to have followed that. It's also that David isn't isn't an elitist, is he? he he's not a kind of, he, he's, he's, you know, he, his work crosses all you know way outside of the so-called art world he's not an elitist in any way he has an amazing gift of communication both with uh, images pictures and with words mm. um and he's quite funny about that actually he's living in france at the moment and um he was saying that uh, some and he's he's french as he confesses his pretty rudimentary schoolboy french and uh, somebody asked him, wasn't it rather difficult living in France and not being able to, sp to, to speak French and the people not being able to understand him? And he said, what do you mean? I've, I've had four or five big exhibitions in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> of course, the French understand me. So it's not <laughs> only necessary to, to, um, to communicate with words, but he can he can cut through very well. He's got a great gift for sort of putting something in a simple, pithy, uh, mm. unpretentious way. Mm. Uh, but uh, that, in a way, is, is almost paradoxical. It's complicated. If you ever talk to David about what he's reading, you know, he's he's rereading Proust for the second or third time. He's reading. Mm. He he eats uh you know, 800 page words with uh, 800 page books with footnotes about quite esoteric subjects he reads all the time he's rather uh, he's he's in his habits he's an intellectual you know, he loves mm. classical mm. music and has loved it from the mm. first time he heard it in bradford when he was a teenager but mm. elitist is a funny word he doesn't come across as a sort of person. there's no barrier between him and anyone he's mm. communicating with Mm, yeah, indeed. So I want to, we'll, we'll come, keep coming back to uh, David's work, I think, but I'd, I'd like to go back a little bit for a moment to uh, Julian Ayres. I was really glad that you mentioned Julian Ayres. I, you know, I, I think we haven't seen enough, you know, 
we, we need a big retrospective of her work, you know. I couldn't agree um, more, yes, couldn't agree more. You know, the, the, there's, there's so much to enjoy. She gives you, so, like David, she gives you so much to enjoy and is you know, unabashed about that. Um, yes. I've, I've always been a, rather sorry we haven't seen much more of her uh, shown. So I, I thought that would be a good way of coming back, coming into this ma mavericks and modernists, um, yes. which I really enjoyed, I must say, you know, uh, um, and you, you, you write about Gillian Ayres in that, and of course you write about Bacon, Freud, Hockney, Kossoff, another painter I, I, I admire tremendously. I went to see that exhibition of drawings a while ago now, and again, I thought this is a, this is, these are master drawings. Um, again, very much agree, yes. Um, mm. Well, um, Gillian would have, if I'd had my way, Gillian would have been on the cover with those other oh. artists, and so actually would Bridget Riley. But uh, mm. uh, they, um, the designers felt that I, I, I felt that it was a book about, it was a sort of choral book about a crowd of people, and I wanted a crowd of people on the cover, but the, uh, the, the people in charge of design felt that that would look too muddled and it wouldn't come through mm. clearly and you know, so, so anyway mm. it ended up with the most famous people group mm. on the cover and they, they're all they're marvelous too and that's yeah um, cool it's a lot about about them but julian actually was one of my absolutely prime helpers with that book she was oh, oh. it was written um towards the end of her life she actually died sadly just before the publication date and the oh. launch party and everything but uh Right up to the moment I finished the manuscript, she was phoning up frequently and telling me mm. long, long, uh, fascinating recollections about uh, you know exactly what it was like being uh, uh, an artist at Camberwell School of Art in 1948 and talking to Victor Passmore and talking to mm. Roger Hilton and um, uh, being an abstract expressionist in London in seven and uh or uh, yeah it, she was um in fact she, she filled in a lot of uh a lot of areas didn't have another sort of first-hand witness where well, certainly no, nobody who, who talked as vividly as she did and mm -hmm. and of course another side being a female artist which is uh, um uh, a much rarer thing when Gillian started out i think uh flouting the uh the will of her headmistress, her parents, or practically everybody, she says, yes. <laughs> said, I'm determined to be off to art school. And then she said, when she got there, uh, other other uh, female students would say, uh, you know, I'm going to devote my life to uh, looking after my boyfriend, who's a great artist, or, or uh, you'll never get anywhere as a painter, you'd better take up needlework or something, you can teach mm. that. And uh, mm. all these, all this discouragement, which, Gillian, who's a very strong personality, just blasted through. I think. <laughs> I can imagine. Paid no attention to whatsoever. But um, I mean, that's so. That, that's something which I mean, it seems like another world. Now uh, there mm. was uh, a photograph we ran in that, uh, which from Gillian's collection of Gillian sitting in a pub in Camberwell in the late 40s uh, just students had opened an ex a little exhibition and uh, they're almost all male students wearing ties and corduroy jackets and that sort of thing smoking mm. pipes sitting around with pints of beer and there's Gillian in the middle of them uh, looking very pretty with a half pint of uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was really lovely reading it because it sort of sent me back to Gillian Ayres, you know, a, a painter that I said I'd like to see more of. Yeah, oh, I, I really, really think the Tate should, uh, Tate Britain or Tate Modern should run a big exhibition. There's plenty of scope. There's there's work yeah. which has never been seen a whole period. Oh, really? Yeah, it's really? It rolled up in her studio. There's a uh, tremendous scope for an exhibition about Gillian. It does, it does make you wonder whether there's something about the British who, who fear joy, you know, um, as, as, if it, as if joy in, her, in work, because there, there's a sort of lavish sensuality in Gillian's paintings mm. and joyfulness and, and embracing of the natural world particularly. Um, uh, it's almost as if there's something in the art establishment or even in British culture that sort of fears Joy and thinks it's it's it's, it's flippant or something like that. Hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's possibly a sort of dour, um, northern Protestant point of view. I, I'm not mm. sure. 
Um, mm. 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 But I, I thought you could say a little bit about, um, can, you know, what, why was there that this incredible flowering of talent at this, you know, which, which this book sort of really carefully kind of goes through? You've got, you know, you've got Hockney, as we've already talked about. You've got uh, Auerbach and um, Kossoff and Bacon and Freud and Gillinaires and um, uh, uh, Bridget Riley. You know, how, what, what do you think caused that sort of, looking back on it, it really is a flowering of talent, isn't it? Yes, yes. What brought it to a critical mass? Uh, yes. It's an interesting question. Well, one, one factor, when I asked people, I asked Frank Auerbach that, that more or less that very question, and he, his answer was, uh, in part, the um, completely unforeseeable and unforeseen advent of Francis Bacon, who arrived virtually out of nowhere in the mid-1940s, and mm. had a pers such a charismatic personality and, you know, and such high standards that it was inspiring just to have somebody like that around. Mm. And um, Frank said that it wasn't even so much uh, Bacon's work, it was the fact that it was it, his uh, extraordinarily high critical standards that he disdained almost everything, including actually mm. his own paintings. And that mm. Frank paradoxically found that inspiring, the idea that here mm. in London, you could, Bacon's idea was you could paint absolute masterpieces, you could rival Velasquez and Titian and you know, the greatest uh, artists they'd ever been. And mm. uh, uh, Frank's view, he was another of my really absolutely, uh, absolutely prime witnesses mm. when I was mm. working on this book. Such um, a wonderful artist. <laughs> uh, well, I agree, yes. Yeah, so, another of Frank's views was that pre-Bacon, pre-war, or just after the war, the earlier generation of the sort of people who he was um, eavesdropping on uh, in, say, 48 or 49 or so when he was... Uh, learning to be an artist, were a bit lazy and amateur. They were all, he said, they all had private incomes and they'd, uh, <laughs> they'd sit in pubs asking each other questions such as, are you working at the moment? And uh, Frank would say, well, plumbers don't ask each other. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, there was an influx. Another thing was a lot of people wanted to be artists uh it had been a very much of a minority occupation in britain before the war and lucian said that he he doubted more than half a dozen artists were making a living out of out of just painting uh uh when he started out if that um mainly portrait painters um but uh, after 1945, art schools filled up. People wanted to be artists. There was a, mm. there was, uh, uh, there was uh, a government um, funding for people who'd been part of the war effort to go into further education. And a surprising number of people chose art schools. They had to run special buses mm. to Camberwell from a <laughs> railway station. <laughs> <laughs> the place was it was absolutely packed out. Uh, so a lot of people, there's a lot of interest. Uh, 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 there was some, by just chance, some powerful talents appeared, uh, and uh, the thing caught fire, I suppose. Mm, 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 it really did caught fire. In, in the book, you talk about this sort of battle for the heart of English painting as well between Picasso and and Matisse. Um, their influence on, on 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 British painting. I wonder whether you might say a bit more about that. Well, Picasso was uh, hugely important in the fifties. That there was um, again going back to Hockney. I, should, I mustn't quote David all the time. He's very quotable. He's he's mm. he's, he's, he said that uh, he he hitchhiked down from. Bradford to see the Jackson Pollock exhibition at the Whitechapel Art Gallery in 1958, which was sort of first big showing of Pollock in Britain. And uh, David says, well, there was a tremendous excitement about it because it seemed that somebody had got away from Picasso, but uh, uh -huh. uh, David added, but actually he was, he, he was, Pollock was also derived from Picasso, really. Yeah. So there, so yeah. there's this sort of very powerful influence. Um, uh, from Paris, and mm. 
then on the uh, the more abstract people, uh, Matisse was very it was a very powerful influence, uh, uh, mm. in particular on the abstract abstract painters. But also mm. late in his life, at any rate, uh, when I was talking to him, uh, Lucian Freud would say that uh, he'd finally decided that in this great comparison, uh, Matisse came out miles ahead. So surprising, oh. surprisingly, Lucian was was a Matisse person. He, he, oh, that's surprising. Yes, he disliked, he disliked, he knew Picasso personally, which I don't think he did. Oh. Uh, he oh. visited his studio in the um, 1940s in Paris several times. Oh. And uh, he felt he was too much for Lucien's taste of a showman. He thought he was always trying to amaze you and surprise you. Whereas, uh, uh, with Matisse's more sort of stepping back, it's to do with what Lucien thought was really important, which he called the life of forms. Mm, mm, mm. Right, so Go, I want to talk more about Lucien Freud now, because yes. what, one of the things that comes out in the book is, well, it's, it's almost like Bacon and Freud, are like the opposite of Hockney. I mean, again, it just shows you how David's painting, he's so much gone his own way, hasn't he? Because, you know, when I look at, well, Bacon's, although they're very passionate, they're, they're searing and, you know, they're, they're crucifixions without any sense of redemption um, is what you see in, in Bacon yes. a lot. And, and Freud, there's this sense of, and I don't know whether this is true, I see, I'd be interested to see what you think, you know, that you're, you're looking at the body as a sort of, as matter, animated matter, without perhaps soul, I don't know, uh, or without, certainly without a religious... I don't know, something like that. I, w I wonder what you think about that sort of, what can seem like a nihilism running through their work and, you well, know. I would, uh, uh, Lucian, I think, was more of an anarchist. Than he, and he, right, he, right. He, uh, he once advised me, um, he certainly was explicitly an anarchist when he was a teenager. He, uh, mm. he told me he tried to get his grandfather, uh, Sigmund, to sign an, a, a pro-anarchist a petition uh, in about 1938, <laughs> and uh, Sigmund Freud uh, refused to sign it. Then, uh, then said, "Beware the uh, beware the cult of the signature." He didn't believe in in, in signing things. And mm -hmm. uh, actually, Lucian gave that as a reason for the fact that he, uh, for most of his career, resolutely refused to sign anything he could avoid signing. Uh, he would uh, say he would say even checks, but his uh, his lawyer says that's not true. But, <laughs> <laughs> he would say that to people who wanted to say, wanted books and posters and things to be signed. But uh, anyway, he was an anarchist. So, um, uh, I don't. I I think actually Lucian also loved life, and um, I mean yeah. what, he, what he said to me uh, about it was that he'd had, he'd had a really lovely time. I remember him mm -hmm. saying that. Um, but he was against, he was opposed to uh, the uh, idea of an afterlife, which he felt was a terrible cheat. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. uh, I remember him saying uh, uh, that it was like insurance, which was something else he didn't believe in. He had no insurance policies. He, he lived in a... <laughs> He, he as an octogenarian, he lived alone in a in, in a house with uh, probably uh, well over a hundred million pounds worth of art and whatnot in it, and no insurance policy. But he said <laughs> the, he said the thing about uh, thing about um, insurance uh, is is that it um, is always the small. Uh, it's a it's a swindle. They insurance uh, people try and get poor people to give them their money, and then when they ask for something in return, the they always point to the small print and they don't get anything and similarly mm. with the afterlife you're you're asked to give up your 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 real life which is the only life you have in favor of this um uh pretend life which doesn't exist and mm. uh, mm. wasn't having any of that anyway quite right too quite yes, right well too. i mean that that would be quite a buddhist point of view i should yeah think. it would be yes yeah very much so and what, what was it, I mean, this is a bit gossipy, but what was it like being painted by Lucy? I mean, you know, you, you think of, you know, those stories of people being, uh, of people being painted by Cezanne and Cezanne, you know, saying, you know, sit like an apple and, all, and losing his temper if, you, temper if you moved at all. 
well, what Lucy was it did, like? Well, Lucy didn't lose his temper in that way. Uh, well, I suppose one could um, sort, sort of uh, uh, appropriate Dickens and say it was the best of times. It wasn't. It wasn't the worst of times. It was. Uh, it certainly uh, dragged on a bit. Uh, it, 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 <laughs> it was. It was. It, uh, you sometimes wondered if it was ever going to end. Um, <laughs> I bet. Uh, but um, uh, it was absolutely fascinating in retrospect. And mm. uh, it, even if sometimes, you know, it's late in the evening after a long day, it's it felt sort of very tiring. And, you know, one, one wondered what, what earthly uh, difference that, uh, the, the picture you, you looked at the, the end of the, the evening, that, and it didn't seem to have changed at all. <laughs> <laughs> In pay, painting away for us, but, um, mm. um, well, it was fascinating. It was fascinating spending so much time in his company, and I think he also, uh, I realised afterwards, he ma he went out of his way to make it as interesting as he could for his mm. sitters because uh, what his anxiety was that sitters would just up sticks, give up. They say they couldn't stand it anymore, and that uh, would have been that would have been a disaster for him because he couldn't sure. work without a model. And he was the danger for him was that he'd invest, uh, you know, 60, 70, 80 hours of work in something, and then the model would say, "Well, I just can't carry on turning up like this," which did happen. There were people, uh, there there were people who said, "I didn't realize it was going to take this long. I'm so I'm sorry about, <laughs> sorry about that, right." <laughs> <laughs> uh so he was very entertaining he was a wonderfully entertaining personality he was witty he was uh, full of anecdotes and stories which i think were probably tailored to the person he was talking to i see that uh, uh, so i uh, i heard a lot about art i heard about uh, what i was telling you earlier on about his visits to picasso for example mm, and, you know, mm. his dinner with man ray and max ernst and uh, mm. things things which were Mm. absolutely reliably kind of catch my attention yes indeed indeed um and i mean what you feel with uh lucian freud is an absolute commitment to the to, to the task isn't it um i mean you feel that with any of those artists we've been talking about um that incredible commitment to work Yes, well, he would say that actually. Well, he, in that respect, he was exactly like David. I, I think there are not there are quite a few parallels, or mm. the results are very different. So mm. he would say, "Well, it's I, I, lots of people, including uh, I myself, as a writer about him when he was alive, would make a big thing about how hard he worked, and it's true. Mm. He did he 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 didn't sleep a great deal at night. He had a nap in the afternoon as well. But uh, mm. you know he." even in his 80s he might you know, start at half past five in the morning and still be painting at three o'clock in the in the morning the next day you know, with breaks mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it's a very very long hours uh, mm -hmm. that would, perhaps would be a bit exceptional but it happened mm -hmm. um uh, uh, lucian's answer was uh, uh people people say that i you know, i work very hard but in a way what i'm doing is completely self-indulgent because i spend all my time doing what more well, almost all my time doing what what most interests and entertains me <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's the other way of looking at it mm, of course i mean another painter that you write about wonderfully in uh, modernism mavericks is um Arbach, who again is you know, renowned for how his hard work, isn't he? Mm. Um, uh, you know, he, I believe he paints every day apart from Christmas Day. That's what I, uh, I've well, heard. He, well, he certainly used to only take one day's holiday. Yeah. Apart, well, I think apart from Christmas Day, he'd, uh, he would go to Brighton and, uh, and go on the pier uh, one day in the summer. And, uh, yeah, it's a pretty, uh, pretty unremitting schedule, which is still keeping going. On now, mm. he's ninety. Mm. 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 So let let's now move on to. I want, oh yes, before I wanted to move, I wanted to. Yeah, I know you've you've interviewed um, Howard Hodgkin a, a lot. Again, a very a very different painter from um, from uh, Bacon and Freud, um, but a painter that's been you know, until his death, you know, working very steadily, again, with very much his own vision. Um, yes, in Monness and Maverick's terms, uh, when I wrote that, I, I was obliged to write quite a bit about, on the one hand, there are figurative 
paintings, on the other hand, they were abstract ones. So that was at the time that was seen as a complete divide, almost like the communist capitalist divide uh, across the Iron Curtain. Mm. But um, actually, in retrospect, maybe that's not quite things weren't nearly so absolute and that it, after all anything which is as actually Lucien Freud would say anything which is any good is abstract in a way mm. yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and conversely there's very little which is so abstract that you can't associate it when you look at it with some aspect of the visible world so mm. even if the artist doesn't intend to be painting something they may end up painting something which is real but the mm. thing about Hodgkin to come to him is that he's he, he right from the beginning he was in the middle in no man's land so if you go back to the Arn Curtain metaphor he was you know he was between the two or mm. the two sets of barbed wire and watchtowers was mm. he he was uh, he would always insist when you talk to him that he was painting something specific, even if mm. it was a feeling. It was never any remotely abstract, but certainly a lot of his paintings, and particularly as he uh, as time went on, looked very, very much like abstract paintings. So um, mm. I think for a while he was seen by everyone as a bit of a marginal eccentric. Yeah, exactly. he didn't. He didn't do quite as badly in the sixties, fifties, uh, and sixties as he made out. He wasn't. It was sort of absolutely at the forefront either. But mm. then later in life, perhaps in the 80s, when things loosened up, he, he what he was doing really became much more comprehensible and he came he came to the fore. Um, mm. It was always an interesting, interesting painter. I, mean, I remember, I'm afraid to say, you know, in, in, when I was at art school at first, I was very disparaging about hot, um, about Hodgkin, because I thought, you know, that de they were decorative, that, you know, therefore bourgeois, and, you know, he was painting with a glass of sherry in his hand and so on. Um, as I matured a little bit, <laughs> making no claims for myself, um, I came to really appreciate the work. And, um, you know, again, he's a, he's a painter very, very popular with the Buddhists I know, you know, that, that show that was at the Haywood, I think. Um, very, very, you know, was, you know, it was a sort of, again, another place of pilgrimage. What is it, do you think, that um, he gives us, um, particularly uh, Hodgkin's work? He was very close, uh, going back to Gillian Ayres, he was very close to Gillian. Um, mm. they, uh, uh, they worked at an art school in the West Country for a while, teaching a few days a, a, a week while living in London, and drove down every day. And uh, Gillian told me they would talk about painting for five hours each <laughs> way in the, in the, in the car. <laughs> Uh, and although um, Gillian's sort of just on the other side of that frontier I was talking about, so she is certainly thought of herself as an abstract artist and wouldn't quite admit to depicting a, a landscape or a flower, although in the last decade or so, the flowers which surrounded her studio did seem to definitely get into the picture. Yes. <laughs> Earlier on, there's a sort of... Uh, unavoidable landscape reference i think mm, um, mm, yes uh, even lyric in the lyric uh, lyric poetry i thought as well you know she yes. uses you know yeah uh, uh howard sort of, sort of just the other side and in howard's mind what he was painting was a hotel room in venice in which somebody had said said something significant which stuck in his mind or or an argument he'd had with somebody over dinner or you know some uh, something some incident he'd never reveal that, that was the other thing he would, never, yes. he would never quite admit what it was he was painting um but um that was obviously part of his it was a carefully worked out part of his plan that it, it was mm. about something and he wasn't going to say what it was and, mm. um mm. so there's so there's a sense of i suppose visual revela revelation in both cases coming from different directions mm. and of different mm. sorts of things mm. Mm. i remember one of the things he, he talked about um sitting having a meal with a male prostitute i think and that th this painting was somehow a reference to some of the things that the male prostitute had said and of course one couldn't help looking for where that, where that was in the painting and if it seemed to be a red smudge or something you know yes um, yes i mean there's probably is, can't, one can speculate on what those sort of some of those yes. might represent. <laughs> um, 
And on the other hand, you'd sometimes he'd give you a bit more of a clue. There's a famous uh, painting, which I think is called A Small Japanese Screen, which has got the writer oh, yes. Bruce Chatwin in it mm. and was mm. based on an evening he'd spent in Chatwin's um, flat in London. And Chatwin gave a description of how it's sort of uh, lumbering around, peering at things. And... Mm. Uh, and Chapman remarking that he'd ended up as a sort of green sm acid green smudge. Mm -hmm. And um, I asked Howard about that. And Howard said, I said well, more or less said, well, the thing, the thing about it was uh, I was in love with Bruce, but Bruce was completely uninterested and disdainful of my work, which would have been <laughs> terribly hurtful. <laughs> to, to Howard. That gives another layer of, of what might be going on in that picture. But you could probably... Probably there was there are lots of things we'll either never find out or mm. uh, you know it would be difficult to uh, but that's pretty true of any painting actually I think that's one yeah. of the one of the challenges of art history is there's so much which so many bits of information an artist may be communicating which just uh, are evanescent disappear very very mm. quickly after the works that have been uh, been done mm. maybe only a message mm. for one person. Mm, indeed. So perhaps let, let's move on to your 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 your, your the, this recent book with Anthony Gormley, uh, shaping the world. Um, so for, just for, say, say a little bit about how that that book came to be. You know, you've you've written these three books with David Hockney, looking at the his, a history of pictures. How did you get to do uh, a book with Anthony Gormley? Well, that sort of grew, grew out in my mind out of the history of pictures. The history of pictures was David's idea, and it's oh. very, very briefly it's his definition of a picture. It's a sort of new uh, classification: is any flat two D. Pre, uh, representation of the world so paintings drawing tapestries uh photographs film computer oh. games all he says that they all have the same problems so they're all they all in a way have the same history a lot of mm. it's about his link links he makes between for example photography and um painting mm. uh well after doing that i i, I felt an an urge to find out more about the other kind of uh, art, which is the 3D sort, which is out in the world. It's not a representation of, of, on a flat screen or canvas. It's in the world. And mm. I'd written also a book, uh, a big book about Michelangelo, which yes. again, who was for, thought of himself as fundamentally a sculptor. Mm. Um, and that also made, made me feel I wanted to find out more about sculpture and then more globally about sculpture and then i thought oh who what artist guide uh companion mentor can i um do embark on this project with and the and anthony's name was the one which immediately came to mind is the only possible person who's uh, who's got the width of interest and erudition his his he's an archaeologist and anthropologist as well as an artist with with a huge range of knowledge and well mm. for example he, he spent a certain amount of time as you probably know as a buddhist uh, novice mm. in mm. Uh, early on in life he's very interested in indian chinese japanese art um, uh, the art of the ancient americas everything so uh, so i thought anthony is is the only imperfect person to write this book with and i very tentatively i wrote a letter saying would you consider doing this project and uh, to my delight he wrote back saying yes so mm -hmm. we so that so we started off and it was a very happy ex mutual ex exploration mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean i remember interviewing here at interviewing here at poetry east and being struck that he he felt to me every inch an artist, Anthony. Um, mm. Yes. You know that once you got you didn't need to talk to him very long. That 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 was just who he was in his being was an artist. I think yes, and that book is um, the text is the the art is 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 it's complete collaboration. It's very, very mm. much to do with the interchange and the things we, in a way we taught each other and the mm. things we did agreed about and didn't agree about. Uh, mm. The title was I came up with, but the visual look of it, it has a very, very great deal to do with Anthony. So it's to the extent mm. that it almost qualifies as a work by Anthony as well. Yes. Virtually every page of the, uh, of the, uh, 
the, the design, every illustration has been very carefully scrutinized and repositioned mm -hmm. and tweaked mm -hmm. personally. So and, and so if it if it looks handsome as I think it does, I think it Anton, does, yeah. Anthony's got a it really is the one who mm -hmm. should take the credit for that. So let, let's look at look look at some of it. We've got a few uh, slides that, to, that we look at some of the work in it. Um, uh, there's this. I, I thought you might say something about. I remember seeing this piece at, uh, at um, Tate Modern. I wonder whether you might say something about that. By, Perhaps keep uh, um, by okay. Oliver Larsen, a Danish Icelandic artist. It's sort of a, uh, called the Weather Project. Uh, so it, it's a sort of, in a way, it's a work, it's a walk-in landscape, uh, and it's I think by far the most successful of all the different um, temporary installations which have been done in the turbine hall at yes, uh, I think so, yeah. and done with extremely simple means actually. Uh, uh, Alarsson uh, fitted up this enormous or artificial sun, uh, essentially a giant light bulb at one end and put um, reflective uh, metal foil on the ceiling so that uh, people, those people on the floor, you can't, you can't see because photographs can't do that sort of thing, are seeing themselves reflected in the ceiling. So it's sort of ah. a complete uh, environment, which is why a lot of people like hang, hanging around there. And he last then changed the atmosphere, filled it with mist. And so it became uh, uh, a, a sort of cosmic uh, environment, a sort of world a model of the world in itself. It was quite a remarkable thing, which made an enormous impression on Anthony, who describes it in very lyrical terms in, in the mm -hmm. text. Mm -hmm. and it, 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 and it's, we, we include it apropos of a sort of linked sequence of thoughts about light being yes. uh, being in itself one of the media out of which art can be made and in, indeed part of an integral part of all sculptures of course they can only be seen with light but also mm. any decent sculptor has got to think about the way that the surfaces of the work will, uh, will respond to light and the way the work's going to be illuminated but also going further some people such as James Terrell uh, make work which of which art is is the only ingredient really mm, mm, mm. So let, let's look at another image from that. I, I really love this Tony Cragg that um, uh, you write about, this, this one here. Um, tell us something about Tony Cragg's work and, and this, this work in particular. I, I, again, like, like the other show, I find it, this beautiful. And for me, yes. that's an important matter. You know? um, it is absolutely beautiful and it's made out of rubbish. Uh, that's mm -hmm. the other thing about it. It's made out of detritus, plastic detritus, which is picked up, uh, uh, which was picked up by the artist, found objects. It's, uh, well, as we approach it, and it's, uh, this is in the book because it's one of Anthony's top favourites and made a, he saw it when it was first exhibited in, I don't know, 1978 or thereabouts and mm -hmm. uh, made a huge impression on him then. And it it's... Um, it's sort of a further step in a in a kind of art we talk about. We talk about Carl Andre and the way in which he made sculptures simply by putting things such as uh, pieces of uh, shaped metal on the floor of the gallery, lay, laying them out so you could walk on them. Um, mm. uh, Tony Crack here has uh, combined that idea with the idea of the found object, uh, mm. which. Yeah. Uh, um, originates, uh, we think of it uh, anyway, as originating with Marcel Duchamp and he and colour because plastic comes in colours and he's made a sort of spectrum on the floor out of carefully selected and positioned bits of plastic waste which then gives it another dimension because of course plastic waste is what is what we're actually now is becoming wise uh, there's a wide realization that it's it's a, a, a terrible scourge which is destroy is killing fish destroying mm. the environment mm. uh, a real problem but mm. uh, 
that's one of the paradoxes of art, uh, Tony Craggs here made a beautiful thing out of it without avoiding that point. Mm -hmm. And actually, when we were talking about art being joyful and pleasurable earlier on, uh, another thing David says is it's not just uh, the pleasure of art is not just to be obtained from looking at pictures of flowers. You know, you can you can enjoy looking at a picture of a crucifixion, which is a picture mm -hmm. of somebody in a state of a state of terrible agony. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the pleasure is to, uh, in in the in the work is is separate from the. Uh, negative aspects of the subject matter mm. there's new kinds of pleasure isn't it that you get in art that it's quite difficult to talk about even a, um a sort of dark pleasure you know um let, let's look at another piece as well let's look at um you know a, a, again a, 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 an artist that's, that's very very i think has become very important for buddhists and this is the artist Ant, Ant, andy goldsworthy um yeah. perhaps say something about about this and why this was included in shaping the world. Well, this is uh, yes. Well, you've picked out three of Anthony's uh, favourite things. This is it. Oh, well, that's good. <laughs> yeah, because it's Anthony's Anthony's favourite uh, Goldsworthy. Um, and uh, what it is, it's at Jupiter Artland in Scotland, and uh, hmm. uh, Goldsworthy discovered that the the bedrock on which the uh, that the this uh, I think sort of Scottish, in which Artland is, is cited, um, uh, uh, which lay underneath that, was was very close to the surface. So that it's like clearing away the earth, you very uh, or the soil rather, you very quickly got down to the actual substance of the. Pit. And mm -hmm. what he did was construct a simple building, uh, which in a way is a sort is a is a physical way of making this point that we are resting on on this lump of rock and here it mm. is it's right beneath our feet and every mm. house well it may have sort of parquet floors or uh um terracotta tiles on uh, uh to walk on is actually resting on this rock and here it is and the rock is in itself a beautiful fascinating ancient thing which goes mm. back to the beginnings as physicists now tell us to the more or less to the beginning of the uh the big bang the beginning of the universe so mm. it's a profound mm. thing as well that's mm. what that's what our civilization our lives our dwellings are built on i think that's mm. what this bit of physical thinking is uh, that's the physical proposition it's making mm. Mm. and that the I mean, that's you feel that they're meditations, don't you? And Andy Goldsworth's work—they're sort of meditations on our our relationship to the world, our interaction with nature. Perhaps even a meditation that self and world aren't as separate as we believe. Mm. Yes. Uh, well, I would agree with all that. I, I, I had my 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 goldsworthy which i put in because it because uh, it rather fitted with uh, a tillman riemann schneider of the uh, uh, the virgin mary ascending into a sort of lot of uh, twirling uh, work, uh, branches and leaves carved out of wood i it was it was of uh, um goldsworthy himself stuck in the branches of a tree in dumfrieshire where he lives uh mm. like sort of man mm. in the tree which i thought was rather nice but that 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 one didn't make the final cut whereas uh, <laughs> whereas, whereas anthony did <laughs> but i'm not suggesting i'm not suggesting that anthony pushed by I, I mean there was a bit of uh, sometimes it was the reverse and that's and my favorite things mm. got in <laughs> so let's we better start to draw this to a close i want to go back to again with another book of yours the pursuit the pursuit of art um uh, a, a wonderful book of essays i think we'll go we'll show you everyone the cover um um you know you've and from that what i what i've been thinking again is well one of the things that's striking is just how many people how many artists you've met you know you've been you know we've been talking about you being painted by Lucian Freud and talking about Freud meeting Picasso. We've been talking about all of your conversations with David Hockney. Um, and David Hockney's a, a great conversationalist. He's a yes. great thinker and speaker about art. You know, there's an essay in here about going to ask, going and talking to Aslam Kiefer. Um, 
uh, a, a slightly comic start to you meeting Robert Rauschenberg um, with a tortoise coming to the lift, I think. Yes, uh, yes, yes. his turtle, his pet turtle. It's, uh, well, That's right. It, it was more that it had to be kept out of the lift because he oh, was <laughs> trouble. trouble try, it, it was always trying to get into the lift. <laughs> <laughs> so you managed to help Robert Rauschenberg keep his turtle out of the lift. <laughs> and then I wondered whether you... From all the people, all, all the artists you met, it's very unusual to meet someone who's met so many um, artists of, of major standing. You know, I, I would include Gillian Ayres and I think, you know, so many of the people that you've spoken to. Artists who work very, very hard. They're not dilettantes. They're not, um, they're, they're, they're deadly serious in, in the right way about what they're doing. Is there any common characteristics that you've noticed in all those? you know, so many interviews that you've, you, you've, you've had? Well, um, I think so, probably, yes. Um, going back to Frank Auerbach, uh, um, uh, Frank, uh, when I published my biography of Michelangelo, which was uh, 2013, I think, Frank, Frank uh, to my delight, uh, uh, um, uh, bought a copy and read it and then he sent me a card uh again hugely flattering and one of the things he said uh was i see the artist type hasn't changed much in the last 500 years <laughs> <laughs> so, so frank obviously thought he recognized trace uh yeah. what could they be well i think um artists uh care very much about things that most people uh, may not even notice i mean another another uh point that comes up in this new book about hockney is hockney is uh what hockney remembers what matters a lot to him he sort of while we were talking he uh he came up with a memory we were talking about color and he said uh oh uh, once i was in um I was in Japan getting a prize or something, and uh, <laughs> uh, up afterwards, it turned out he'd, he'd got the uh, extraordinarily prestigious, prestigious thing, uh, uh, which was uh, funded by 